very much indeed. Thank you, Dieter. Um, we're going to be quick with these questions, so we'll go back to the principle of no statements. So if I can see some hands in the air. There's one down here at the front. Have we got a microphone, please, at the front? Just in on the right-hand side, second row back. Microphone six. Uh, Hugh Fell from Northumberland. Uh, Dieter, can I just talk about land values? As long as it's a question. Yep. Do you think we've got the toolkit and the methodology available to reflect natural capital assets in the valuation of land going forward? Um, well, the, the answer to that is, if you want to say, have we got the perfect answer to the perfect valuation, no, and we never will. But I'd rather be roughly right than precisely wrong. Currently, we add zero to a many, number of these things, and therefore, farmers aren't incentivized and rewarded for looking after these things. We've made great progress through the Natural Capital Committee. We have the Office of National Statistics producing national natural capital accounts, which hold the government's feet to the fire because they show that national natural capital is still going downhill. Um, and we've developed a corporate template for businesses to use, creation of asset registers, asset balance sheets, etc., which is all publicly available and applicable directly to farms. We've done some case studies with a number of farming interests to develop these things forward. So we do know what some of them are worth, and to pretend that the value is zero is precisely wrong. But is there more to do? Yeah, and it's pretty exciting, and it really does help to identify and unlock value for farmers, for the British public, and therefore better design the subsidies. As a surveyor and a former banker, you asked my first question. Uh, we're going to move over there. I think the, the key there is making sure that people understand that they need to understand the value. If you can't mm -hmm. measure it, Absolutely. you can't manage it. So. Yep. Uh, Tom Bradshaw, Farmer from Essex. Dee, you say the market determining value, but when we don't have access to the same technologies, I'm thinking about uh, GM, I'm thinking about plant protection products, growth hormones, etc. yet we rely on the import of those products, so that th 3 million tonnes of GM produce coming into the UK every year. How can we expect the market to really determine a fair value when it's being influenced by those products we don't have access to using? Okay, so, so the answer to that is in two parts. Those who are in favour of Brexit want to take back control. So they want to decide for Britain, for the UK, what standards we wish to have. And I have no particular view on whether some things are good or some things are bad, but you bring forward the GMO uh, issue. Okay. Now, if we want to have different standards, and the Secretary of State made it absolutely clear he wants higher standards, higher welfare standards in particular, um, than currently in place, and other countries don't, you have to have a border adjustment. You can't allow free trade, free trade, it's a nonsense, this idea that one set of rules applies to one set of uh, 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 players and another set of rules play to another. You simply arbitrage the rules and you'll end up with lower welfare than you started for because, as you point out, we'll simply import more and more of this stuff because costs will be higher here than there. So you have to have a border adjustment. And this is why I said in my presentation, these trade issues are the really important ones. So how do you do it? Right? I've designed a border adjustment for carbon because other countries don't follow carbon policies like we do in Britain, don't impose the costs that we impose in Britain elsewhere. So you make an adjustment at the border. But we really need to think about how to do that. And what I think is remarkable is virtually no thought has been given to this problem. And, and we have to be very careful. This, it's very easy to say, free trade. It's a kind of meaningless slogan. What we mean is trade on a fair basis of common rules. That's what we mean. No artificial distortions. But it's perfectly open to choose higher standards. But you do have to do the border adjustment. But the second... The second State also said that uh, past, past attempts to influence trade had, it, had it resulted in consumers spending more money, and that's not something that he's going to condone either. So well, well, hang on, there's two bits to this, okay? So, uh, I mean, I listened very carefully too. Um, on the uh, EU free trade arrangement, uh, the implication is that we're using the same standards as the EU. If we deviate from them, then we'll have to do something about that. Now, on the question of consumer prices, well, we could have really cheap food. We really could abolish all the environmental standards. We could reduce all constraints on, on, on what happens and go for the absolute cheapest. That isn't, I mean, consumers aren't simply buying price. 
They're buying a combination of price and quality and the choice that goes with it. And that is taking back control. You can decide what standards you want. But if you say we shouldn't have higher standards because other countries have lower standards and they'll have a competitive advantage if they have lower standards, my reply is very simple. No, you have to adjust at the border. Okay? But if you don't want to adjust at the border and you want higher standards, you get yourself into an absurd position where you make the solution worse than it was originally. And just an aside, I worked this out for carbon several years ago in my Carbon Crunch book. Of course, we reduced carbon emissions in Britain by measuring carbon production, and we, between 1990 and 2005, reduced them by 15%. Uh, post the boys, post the girls of the carbon world. But we increased carbon consumption by 19% in the same period because we imported the steel, the cement, and everything else from China instead of producing it here, and they had a higher coal intensity of production than we did. That's exactly why you have to focus very carefully on those border adjustment issues. They're unavoidable. Very conscious of time. This mic here in the middle there. Very quick question, uh, and then we will be off for lunch. Thank you. M Mike Clark from RSPB. Um, Dieter, I was just wonder if you could say something about the scale of public money that might be needed for these public goods. Um, Secretary of State this morning was pretty silent on that, perhaps not surprisingly, but certainly there's estimates that show, I mean, we've been part of estimates that show even current levels of environmental standards could require 2.3 billion before you include Mr. Gove's ambition for enhancing natural capital and the other public goods he also mentioned that ought to be part of, uh, as you indicated, part of consideration. Okay, so um, it's another factor which farmers ought to bear in mind that they're not the only recipients of public monies and there are other pressing cases. So if you listen to the radio this morning, you'll hear all about the health service being short of money. And for many urban MPs in particular, the question, if you've got a, 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 a two or three billion to spend, should you spend it on the health service or should you spend it on farming subsidies? Uh, this debate is going to happen. That's what taking back control is all about if you're in favour of Brexit. In the old days, you couldn't have that debate because the CAP fixed it. Okay? And therefore it was given and the Treasury could do nothing about it. Now the Treasury is in control because these are our monies and they can decide amongst the many competing claims for uh, public monies, for public goods, how much should farming get. That may be a very, very salutary and hard lesson for those who were so keen on the Brexit outcome in terms of the totality of the quantum. So there is no agreement between the view that we should have so and so much money available for farming and the Treasury view that we should subject this to proper cost-benefit analysis, except for this transition period which is pointed out by the Secretary of State. How much money? Well, my starting point is, I can't think of less I could achieve for three billion than we currently achieve. I can't think how you can do it worse than we currently do. If you gave me three billion to spend, and I was trying to uh, engineer public goods from that, I couldn't possibly do worse than giving two billion of it for the ownership of land. That's absolutely clear. Now, do we need some more? Well, that's an open question. Depends whether the polluters are paying. Right? So we could spend a lot of money on uh, uh, decarbonisation because people aren't paying the price of carbon. So the other side of the fiscal balance that the agricultural sector has to look at is what is the balance of taxes and producer responsibility and pollution charges and the requirements will come with that which will lead to an environment that's better than it otherwise would have been, which will then not require more subsidies that you're talking about, Mike, to achieve those objectives. None of this has been worked out yet. And that's why I think that um, it's not just the trade issues that the farming interest needs to get going on, but they really need to think about what a sustainable basis of subsidies, uh, taxes, uh, cost-benefit uh, spending will stand up to not to a DEFRA inspection in 2023, but to a Treasury inspection pursuing taking back control in the national interest, all in inverted commas. Dieter, there's a, there's a lot to think about there. You mentioned that these negotiations going forward are the most important. Without an environment, there is no economy. Um, so there's a big challenge out there to this audience to engage to the discussions. Um, I'm ever an optimist. I hope that there's a place for opportunity for both. The work that the Royal Highland Education Trust do in Scotland is about educating where people's food comes from at the right age in the next generation. 
Um, and that's what farming has to do. It has to justify its position in the economy, not just in our landscape. So yeah, and, and I should say, all of what we've done in the Natural Capital Committee, which was first of all to work out the concepts, the measurement, the framework, to propose the 25-year plan, to propose the pilots, to give the advice to the Secretary of State, and now to work on the implication, all in the public domain, and we've been involved a lot with the agricultural uh, 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 frame of this, of course, and that's all open for people to participate in going forward within the limited framework of the resources that we have to actually handle all the inputs that people might want to make. Good. Well, Dieter, thank you ever so much for coming to speak to us. You've laid down a bit of a gauntlet there. We are tight for time.